Philip, uh, thanks so much. Uh, uh, as a um, Southern Baptist, grew up Southern Baptist, <laughs> it, 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 it First Baptist in Shambly, Georgia, Meridian, Mississippi, Pensacola, Florida. I mean, these were very conservative evangelical churches. I must say that what I was taught when we went to church and training union and Bible study and Wednesday night dinner, you know, four times a week, it was about the Beatitudes. It was about the Good Samaritan. It was about Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Mm. It was not about what we're hearing today. What's happened to... Let me just say evangelicals. I won't say the church. Evangelicals, when I read some of these surveys, that I and I don't even recognize my friends sometimes on some of these issues that I've grown up with. Well, you went to a healthy church. My church pulled out of the Southern Baptist Convention. They were too liberal, and we were taught <laughs> racism straight from the pulpit. So I had some major uh, conversion to take place. Uh, but I think what happened is that the word evangelical went from being a, a theological word, a religious word, to a political word. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, Joe, but Time Magazine did a cover story called The Year of the Evangelical. When was that? It was in 1976 when Jimmy Carter was elected. Democratic president, Democratic agenda. But evangelical was what he was teaching in Sunday school. It's what he believed about God. It's exactly what you said. Jesus' sermon in Matthew 25, uh, caring for justice, caring for the sick, caring for those who are marginalized. You were taught that. I was not, frankly. But uh, that's what evangelical means in many parts of the world still. Still, if you ask somebody in, in India, for example, what's an evangelical? Well, I don't know, but they do a lot of the health care in our country, and they care for people with leprosy, and about half of the of the healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa is run by mission agencies, by evangelicals. And that's what we used to be known for. And then like everything else in America, it got, got slammed into this political binary. You're either for us or yeah. against us. And it's, it's a great tragedy, I think. Well, and, and, and what's so surprising to me is that the issues that are identified, that can be worthy issues, but some of the issues that are identified are, are not in any of the red letters of the Gospels of Jesus Christ. And there's a hyper-focus on issues that have been deliberately used to, to politicize the church. And, and what you just said, it's such an incredible uh, insight that I wish you could expand on a little bit. You go across the globe, being an evangelical means doing what Jesus says will be judged right. by in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Exactly. I still see that here. You know, during Hurricane Katrina, when I was complaining every day about how the government wasn't being there, there was one evangelical group after another mm. evangelical group after another evangelical group in Louisiana, in Mississippi, delivering the things the government wasn't. So, again, what's happened? How have we turned from this Good Samaritan movement to a movement where everything is warped for politics. Well, you're absolutely right about choosing a few issues and making those kind of the hallmarks. Abortion and the gay issues are right at the top. Interestingly, Jesus never mentioned either one of those issues, even though they existed in his day in the Roman Empire. And it is a little strange that a movement becomes known, at least in the media, for two issues that Jesus never even mentioned. And I think what's happened Joe, is that people started looking at evangelicals and those people in the country who think there's something wrong, we're going the wrong direction, uh, look at te television, look at cable TV, it's a profane culture now, what happened here? We need to get our country back. Those kind of people kind of adopted the name, the label evangelical when Surveys show many of them don't even can't even name two out of the four Gospels. It became a political marker, and it shouldn't be a political marker. It should be exactly what you described. People who are actually act out there doing the work of, that Jesus assigned to us. It is happening. I uh, am leaving, for example, this week. I'm going to Ireland, Northern Ireland, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Prison Fellowship. 
it's an organization that was founded by Chuck Colson, who had a dramatic conversion when he was in prison, and he went out and all over the world, there are volunteers who, in many countries, they don't feed their prisoners. They, you, they rely on volunteers and family. And places like Brian Stevenson's museums in Montgomery and uh, the International Justice Mission run by Gary Haugen, these are great evangelical organizations run by evangelicals, but they don't get a lot of press. These days, it's the political lens that we see everything through, and, and that's a real shame. Reverend Al's with us and has a question. Rev. Uh, Philip, uh, thank you, first of all, for, for your witness. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you, because of about my own growth in this, uh, I, I was never racist or anti-Semitic, but would say things I shouldn't say, playing to the crowd. And uh, Mrs. Coretta Scott King uh, was the one that kind of said, wait a minute, you can't be both. And, and admonished uh, me to not use language, including the N-word. Do you uh. think that evangelical leaders and Christian leaders uh, should be openly denouncing those that are using violent language and vile things? It's not enough not to participate. And I'm, I'm asking you this because they just played Senator Scott, who kind of like would not attack something <laughs> Trump said. Don't we also have a responsibility to not only not do it, but also to say when someone does it that that's wrong or that we disagree with it forthright and not try to uh, kind of pull our punches? Absolutely, I agree with you. One of the things that just shocked me early in Trump's presidency was when he would use words like deranged and human scum to describe his enemies, enemies of the state. And I'm from a generation when we would address our opponents by something like my right honorable opponent what a what a fall in uh, just the civility of our nation that was introduced by trump and i don't think anybody can can really justify that and i don't think it helps them at all so i agree with you yeah it should be denounced it should be called out and I think we're at the top of the hour. I just, I just want to underline one, one, one final thing here because you, 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 you brought this up, and um, Philip, um, I remember when Nancy Pelosi said that she prayed for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. said, "Oh, that's a lie. Why would she pray for me?" And I'm not making this about Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump. I want to expand it out and just talk about evangelicals and people who follow Christ. Um, you know, right there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, uh, you've heard it said, love your friends and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies too. pray for yeah, those who persecute yeah. you. If you only love those who love you, what good are you doing? Even sinners do that. This is again, this is the sort, this is, this is just the sort of, 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 of spirit that seems to be completely missing, at least in the public sphere uh, when when people who claim to be evangelicals get engaged in politics. You're absolutely right. And, and we need some prophetic voices. Uh, I was born and bred a racist, and it, it really took uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Sharp Sharpton knows almost every one who was a leader in the civil rights movement in those days was a reverend from John Lewis to Stokely Carmichael to Jesse Jackson. And they were appealing to a higher power. And it was Martin Luther King Jr. who actually took that principle of love your enemies and put it into practice. He said, I got to love the policeman who's hitting me with a billy club, the jailer who's making my life miserable. I've got to somehow find a way to love that person. We got to start there. And he appealed to a higher power. And I think that's what we're lacking today. It's so much you versus me, what side are you on? We don't have a higher power that we can appeal to, which is so different from the, the dramatic change that took place during the civil rights movement of the 1960s.